Live is our way of bringing uh, slow food into your home um, during this pandemic and also figuring out how to partner with our local food community and producers, makers, farmers, fishers, harvesters, chefs, and organizations um, whose sole purpose is to feed those that do not have access to fresh, uh, nutritious, rich foods. Um, if you're not if you're not um, familiar with Slow Food, uh, we are a not-for-profit international grassroots movement uh, that was founded by Carlo Petrini 30 years ago in Italy. We are in 160 countries with 104 local chapters across the nation with a common mission of good, clean, and fair food for all. Um, everything we do around the world takes a little bit of a different shape, uh, depending on the culture, place, and the context of the state of the world. But the mission is always the same. Uh, we, re we revive endangered foods that provide important biodiversity to our food system and are working uh, hard at intersections of food, race, class, gender, and climate. And when we work in harmony like this, we bring together joy and justice, uh, which is our two slow food pillars. Uh, and that brings us together a resilient ecosystem where we can build and uphold a great diversity of people, cultures, places, foods, and tastes. And here on the east end of Long Island, we have one of the largest chapters across the country, as you know. Uh, and what makes our chapter so successful is the partnerships, volunteers, and members like some of you on this webinar today. Um, and hopefully by the end of this month, as Anne was saying, uh, some of you, you know, who are not members will join. And those who are members, um, you know, if you're expiring to renew. Um, and, you know, that's, that's what Slow Food's about. But Without further ado, I really am super, super excited uh, to have here today uh, from Wading River is Taylor Knapp, the snail wrangler, as he's called, of uh, Peconic Escargot. He is going to demo for us uh, some snail recipes. But before uh, we get into um, that, we are going to say a quick hello to Taylor. And then we're going to jump into a 23 minute video about his journey to becoming a snail farmer. So, Taylor, you want to say hi? Am I on? You are on. There you are. Well, welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm sure you have some questions about the process of snail farming. We thought that this video uh, that we're going to show from a PBS episode uh, that aired two years ago would do a really good job of explaining the process of it. Um, and how it all kind of works, the ins and outs of the farm itself. It would have been a little messy to try and take the phone in there and, and kind of, you know, dig around in there that way. So this, this will give you a great view of, of kind of the operation as a whole. And then if you have any specific questions about, about any, anything at all um, with the snail farming process, um, let me know and, and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, and then, yeah, like Laura said, I've got three... Uh, very easy recipes that I'm going to kind of um, walk you through uh, things that are super easy to make at home with with our products. So perfect. All right. Without further ado, I'm going to show the film. People have been eating land snails for about 30,000 years, but the majority of what we eat here in America comes out of a can from a foreign country. That's starting to change as heliculture, also known as snail farming, is picking up traction. And so we're gonna meet up today with the folks from Peconic Escargot here on Long Island. I grew up in Indiana, and the food bug kind of came about, I think, through my grandfather, who was a big connoisseur of oysters and, you know, foie gras and, and all of these kind of strange uh, ingredients. And I would go out and I would forage with him in the woods of Indiana. We'd pick mushrooms and, and pawpaws and whatever else was out there and available. And so he was kind of the, the, the foodie of the family. And it kind of inspired me to get started in that too. So uh, I gave it a try in high school through a vocational program and decided I wanted to kind of pursue it further. So I've been cooking uh, professionally for about 12 years, kind of all over the country, a lot on the East Coast and a little bit in Europe. 
in 2010, I made my way out to Long Island and didn't really know about the scene out here and the fact that we could go from a beach to a vineyard to foraging in the woods all within a very small radius. Just kind of fell in love with it. Out here on Long Island, I was the chef at a restaurant called First and South in Greenport and I took a really kind of targeted local approach with the menu as is quite popular these days, but I also wanted to have some surprises on there. So I thought it would be fun to put some snails on the menu, to do an escargot dish. And I looked and I tried to find some fresh locally raised snails and we couldn't find them anywhere. And we looked, you know, kind of all over the East Coast and figured there might be someone doing it and there was nothing. So then we kind of ultimately came to the conclusion that there was no one raising these snails um, at all, uh, not for fresh consumption. I couldn't even bring them in fresh from another country. The only way you could get uh, escargot in the U.S. was to get them from a can or frozen, kind of pre-prepared. A chef friend of mine, but he's a really knowledgeable guy, I had texted him and I said, do you know of anyone raising snails in the U.S.? And he jokingly replied, uh, no, you should start a farm. You should raise them yourself. And I like totally blew it off. That's, you know, that's ridiculous. But it was a long winter on the North Fork and it gets a little slow out here because it's very seasonal. And so the gears started turning and uh, I molded over and decided, well, why not? Let's, let's look into this and see, maybe there's something here. And so a lot of research and work and, you know, a couple months later, it kind of settled on the idea that we were going to give it a shot and see what would come of it. We haven't done any official polls, but I think 99% of Americans that eat escargot probably don't realize that they're coming out of a can from another country even. So to be able to say this is a fresh product that came from the United States and was raised here, that's kind of eye-opening for them. It's a completely different product from the canned stuff. As with most canned products, there's a lot of sodium in there, and it's been cooked for a long time. So it's kind of just tastes like a, any sort of piece of meaty bit. You know, that's, that's really it. But the fresh snails have a texture to them. They pop, they're kind of juicy. And they have a sort of very earthy, herbaceous flavor, especially the way that we're raising them. We're trying to mimic their diet as close as possible what they would be eating in the wild. A lot of that is wild greens, so we'll forage greens from all over Long Island, and the snails like it. They eat a lot of dirt because they need the calcium for their shells, and then we're finishing them on spent grain from some of the local breweries. And that does a couple different things. It moves any you know impurities out of their system so that you're not eating it, and then it kind of lends a nice, nutty, uh, toasty note to the final product, which is cool. There's kind of a terroir about it all. The snails are eating greens from Long Island. They're raised on Long Island. It couldn't get any more like fresh and domestic than that. Small food producers need a commercial kitchen in order to bring their products to market. So places like Stony Brook Business Incubator step in and they offer these entrepreneurs not only kitchens, but also the support they need to succeed. Stony Brook University has an incubation program and the purpose of it is to support fledgling companies that are in the early stages of growth and need support from infrastructure to business guidance. The particular incubator we're in today, the Calverton Incubator, has a commercial food kitchen for food product companies. There is a desire for local food, for natural products, for organic products, for fresh products, not just produce. And that has shifted this market interest to smaller companies because that's where innovation tends to come from from the small companies that disrupt the status quo. And we're trying to create an infrastructure to support those companies and increase the rate of innovation in the food industry. When I first learned about Peconic Escargot and what they were bringing to the market, I was stunned to find out that they were the only producer in the United States that could deliver fresh escargot to restaurants and food companies. I had no idea that there was that limitation, that any escargot I had eaten to date came out of a can. And I think that's quite a novel value and creates a very nice opportunity for them in the market. The 
Stony Brook University incubator at Calberton is where we process all of our snails. And it's really provided us the opportunity to put together a professional sanitary product very easily and cost effectively. I'm standing here with Taylor and Kate while they're processing their snails. They're sorting out which ones have very firm shells and which are brittle. And they're actually going to go through 7,000 snails today. They'll be here for many hours. And so some chefs want just the body, and some chefs want the snail in the shell. Is that why you're separating these out? Yeah, exactly. So there's an old school technique of maybe braising the snail in the shell. They're great that way, but they do involve a little labor for the customer because you have to pick them out. And they're not the easiest thing to pick out of a shell. So. If you're looking for an easy eating experience for your, your customer, out of the shell would be the way to go. And then, you know, you could put them over a risotto or pasta or pizza, and they're just, they're ready to eat. So we have a lot of chefs that take them that way, but some prefer them in the shell. Well, and so I'm really excited to chat with some of the chefs who are using these snails because you just don't see escargot on menus other than drowning in butter and garlic. There's a classic preparation and then that seems like it. Yeah, we're hoping to kind of have a bit of a escargot renaissance and see if we can get some chefs to, to cook with these in kind of a different light very creatively and just see how versatile they are. So Kate, my wife, She's super helpful with day-to-day -day operations. She's either sorting the snails or pulling out eggs, feeding them, moving them around, getting them ready for processing, and then she plays a big role in our processing day, and she's great at that. She's a much faster snail picker than I am, so I'm thankful that she's around. Kate has agreed to teach me how to pick one of these things, and She's promised not to laugh if I screw it up. I promise I won't. <laughs> so is this just a sewing needle? Yes. Cool. What's the technique? Uh, well, are you righty or lefty? Righty. OK, so you want the needle on your right hand. OK. And basically, all you do is you hold the shell like this. Mm -hmm. And then you take the needle and you poke it right here at the foot of the snail. Then you kind of twist the shell this way. So you follow the it. spiral. Right, you follow the spiral. Not bad. Oh, yeah. All right. Not bad at all. It's fun, actually. I'm sure after doing 7,000, not, so, not fun. so fun. Come come talk to us in five hours. Exactly. All right, well, I'm going to stand here and help with their 7,000 snails. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> I'll be there in just about five minutes. Thanks so much. Relationships with the chefs are key. That's kind of our platform that allows us to do what we do. And for them to know the whole story about how these snails came to be, it makes it special for them. And so it becomes a worthwhile, valuable product. We have his cargo from here, and it's beautiful. And, you know, there's a pride, there's a connection, there's a story that's very important, sometimes neglected by people, but the story behind what we eat. If you want to try to have a print of the terroir in a way, I mean, escargot feeds off the soil of the place. That's a print, that's a direct print, right? And you taste it. For me, like, it's more delicate, more refined. It's beautiful. So I'm making this escargot dish. We call it escargot and chorizo. Hugh made a delicious Spanish-style, kind of a Basque region uh, preparation. He did a cast iron saute of baked apples, some house-made chorizo, and kind of reduced cider and maple syrup with the whole in-shell snail. He had kind of stewed them or braised them in advance, and then he added them to this dish and kind of glazed them with butter and with the drippings from the chorizo, which is an incredible preparation.
Fresh snails are an incredibly unique ingredient, and here at Industry Standard, Chef Greg is playing around with Asian flavors. Let's get in the kitchen and chat with him. Here in America, chefs never work with fresh snails. The tailors start growing them. I remember hearing about actually when I was dating this other girl that, that knew him, and she's like, yeah, this, this uh, idiot is opening a voice on snail farm. I'm like, snail farm, that's crazy. Taylor said, do you want to try this stuff? And I was like, sure, you know? And I tried it out, I was blown away. You taste it immediately. It's a herbaceous mushroom taste to it, and it's sweet. If you treat it like really nice shrimp or langoustine, that's how I try to approach it. Greg does an incredible job. He's very creative, and he's always kind of coming up with new preparations. Months before we were even really up and running, we gave him some of our early test batches, and he would come up with a couple dishes. It was crazy, because the first thing he comes up with is a ramen dish, and then this incredible wonton with a fermented black bean vinaigrette. And that's totally not what we were thinking. You know, we were like, here's some snails. I'm sure he'll cook them in garlic and butter and call it a day. But no, he went above and beyond, so it was just an eye-opening experience. You know, that was a moment where we were like, holy cow, like, this could be anything. It could be, it could be whatever you want it to be. It could go into any restaurant, no matter what kind of food they're serving, and fit in well with any of that stuff. is expensive. It is so expensive, in fact, that it can be very difficult for farmers to get started and also to keep their farms. So the Peconic Land Trust has launched an incredibly innovative program called Farms for the Future, and we are going to meet their director next. All right, Dan and I are heading to the farm. Which farm are we going to see first? Well, I think we're going to go down to our agricultural center in Southold, and we'll get started there. All right. We're down here at the agricultural center in Southold. The whole farm is 23 and a half acres, and what we do here is get new farmers started. Each farmer gets one acre for up to five years. Most of the new farmers don't have equipment, and they don't have access to any of the infrastructure. So it's pretty much a turnkey. If they want to give it a try, we have what's necessary to get started. So this farm here, we're actually started a rent here to feisty acres. Feisty acres. Feisty acres. And they're the ones that are doing different types of game birds. At the trust here, we try to protect the whole history of farming and the whole business of farming. We buy farmland. We also get farmland donated to us, and we protect the farmland from development. The Peconic Land Trust has kind of a, a new farmer initiative where they look for these new kind of startup companies, and they bring those people on. They'll give them a small parcel of land for a highly discounted rate but they kind of incubate that farming operation for a number of years until they're ready to kind of be put out on their own. We were lucky enough to be accepted by their board after a lot of convincing because they were all kind of new to the snail farming movement. Taylor, I thought he had a very good idea. Um, he's certainly a part of the program. This was a little different because he didn't need actually farm land. He just needed a spot for his greenhouse. Have you ever heard of snail caviar? No? Well, you are not the only one. It is a relatively unknown delicacy here in the U.S. The eggs are tiny and they're white. And here is another really interesting snail fact. They are all hermaphrodites, which means they all can lay eggs. So we're actually going to go inside right now and taste some of that caviar with Taylor. Right here in the container is a pile of the little tiny white eggs. Fresh snail caviar. So this is uncured snail caviar. When we start producing this on a larger format, we'll gather this and cure it in a salt solution uh, for about a day or so, and then it'll get packed into caviar tins and, and shipped out to restaurants all over the country. So, wow. But now we're going to taste this fresh. So this is a little pile that we dug out of the soil. The snails will bury themselves in the dirt, kind of like a little turtle, and they'll deposit this clutch of eggs uh, into the soil, and then they'll come back up, cover the nest up with dirt, and then kind of move away. And then two weeks later, 
the uh, little baby snails will hatch and, and come out of the nest. But uh, yeah, we're gonna give these a little taste so you'll get to see what, what fresh snail uh, caviar tastes like. Awesome. It's really mild. And it is a little bit mushroomy, a little bit carroty, where, you know, caviar caviar, fish bro, has a very strong, briny, sea, bracing flavor. You're right, this is just really, really gentle. Yeah. You're really innovating new products for people to use in restaurant settings. There are some producers of snail caviar in, in Europe, but um, they're not willing to give away their secrets. So we're, <laughs> we're kind of you know, breaking our own ground here in the US with this and, and figuring it out as we go. And uh, yeah, we're, we're happy to offer a new innovative product to the chefs and they're excited to try it out, yeah. This little snail? So he's maybe two or three weeks old. This is a full grown adult, so well over, you know, eight months old. When the snails are mature, they'll be ready to mate. So at that point, they'll find somebody else that's interested. Uh, they're hermaphrodites, so it could really be anyone. And then they'll be about a month after mating uh, before they're ready to lay eggs. So another interesting thing about these is they have a mechanism called a love dart. Okay. Uh, which is actually a calcified spear that they form and they will shoot into whoever they've chosen to be their mating partner, which is meant to sort of signal that it's time to go. There'll be a little spear sticking out of the snail's body. Well, okay. I'm speechless because that is so cool. Yeah, it's pretty neat. <laughs> this is where the Here snails are. This is where the snails are hanging out. That's right. We've got somewhere between 40 and 50,000 snails right now. Uh, and they're all sleeping, so it's very quiet. Uh, they're nocturnal. <laughs> Is it noisy when they're awake? It's noisy when they're awake. It's like a <laughs> snail party in here at night. They're nocturnal animals, so they sleep during the day, they party at night. So they're hermaphrodites, they have thousands of teeth, they have buggy little eyes. The eyes are on the tops of some long antennas to help them kind of see and, and sense the world around them. They have some smaller, like, sensory antennas really kind of coming out near their mouth that helps them kind of understand what's going on. Their eyesight's not so great, and they can't hear. They don't have ears. But uh, they do a pretty good job of figuring out what's going on around them. So the species that we raise is the petit gris, or the little gray snail. Cornu aspersum is the Latin name. This species came from Europe to the United States in the 1850s as a food source, and they kind of went nuts. They went wild um, because they reproduced very quickly, and they became a pest. Uh, they eat up a lot of agriculture, homeowners, gardens. They'll kind of wreak havoc in there. At one point, uh, you know, maybe 15, 20 years ago, the U.S. government dubbed it an invasive species and made it very difficult for people to raise and grow them. So we had to do a lot of work with them to be able to bring them into the state of New York because they're not native here, and that took a lot of uh, collaboration with the government to be on the same page with how we were going to contain them. We hatched this idea of putting them inside a greenhouse where they'd be able to get lots of sunlight, fresh air, have this kind of like outdoor environment without actually being outdoors. And the other thing is that we didn't have a whole lot of money, so we went with a pretty small greenhouse. It's about 300 square feet. But to be able to have more production, we went with a stacking kind of shelving system. So instead of having the snails all laid out on the ground, we decided to put them in contained pens. We're able to have you know, upwards of 100,000 snails in that greenhouse if we need to, all in a very small sort of footprint space. You still are a chef because he actually runs these pop-up dinners called Paw Paw. How often do you do those? Uh, most Saturday nights. So an actual, you know, working chef. What made you decide that you wanted to become a farmer first off and a snail farmer of all things second? Yeah, well, I suppose fascination and curiosity uh, drove a lot of it and just the challenge of doing this after you know cooking in some pretty high-end stressful restaurants for 12 years a change of pace is is kind of a good thing this is definitely not stressful no this is very calming <laughs> i come out here i listen to the birds chirping and the wind breezing and we just get to hang out with the snails these snails i love that they're kind of weird you know that's cool because weird stuff is fun and exciting i'm learning new things about them all the time 
and then the connection food-wise to how they can be prepared and how delicious they are, that's exciting for me on, you know, kind of a chef level too. And then just seeing the joy and content in chefs and home cooks' faces when we get to give them these things is super enriching for us. It's just the whole process of being able to offer something that people either haven't had yet or haven't had in a long time is really exciting. Yeah. That's, a really good. That's really great. That's wonderful. So, Taylor Knapp, I remember, I just have to share this bit. I remember when I met Taylor at the Harvest East End, it was the first time that I met Taylor. And he did this really interesting, he did this really interesting dish where you, you took, you made an actual cracker out of an oyster. And your presentation was so spectacular. I always remember how, I remember in that moment when I met you on how creative you are. And when I ate at Paw Paw, how creative you are. And you talk about, about how you got into, you know, doing snails that, that it's fascinating and that you have a curiosity. And that for me comes through in the way that you cook and you present your food. It's very creative. It's, when, when, when someone sits down and dines and is able to eat what you create, you get the sense of terroir, you get the sense of creativity. It's always a, a very, it's a delight and it's a surprise. And so it doesn't surprise me that, that you are um, a snail wrangler and that you're a snail farmer. And I'm so honored that you are snailing our mascot. <laughs> right. So, um, Anyway, I just had to add that little tidbit, but we're all looking forward to your demo. And if anyone has any questions, please put it in the chat and then we can, we can ask you as we go. Cool, cool. Okay, can, can everyone hear me? Am I not, I'm not. We could hear you. Okay, great. Uh, so we've just started, as, as many of you may or may not know, we're in a pandemic. And uh, it's been quite a wild ride for us as a business uh, because 99% of our sales were going to uh, fine dining restaurants all over the country, uh, many of them in New York City, which is just having a really hard time with this right now. Um, some of you might know you can't even eat inside a restaurant in New York City right now. Hopefully by the end of the month, you'll be able to. Um, but so, so those restaurants, many of them didn't didn't reopen. Some of them closed permanently. And the ones that did reopen um, have such low capacity numbers that, um, that they've really had to scale back on their menus. They're offering much smaller menus and they're, they're not bringing in a lot of those luxury ingredients. So, um, you know, things like escargot, caviar, foie gras, those kind of go out the window. And a lot of these chefs kind of get back to basics, which we understand. Um, however, we still have snails. We still have a lot of them and, uh, and they need to be sold. So the snails have a life span of five years. Um, so none of them are like dropping dead. However, our greenhouse um, only has so much capacity in it. So we still need to move this product. Um, so while we've always had um, outlets, retail outlets for home cooks through our website, uh, and through overnight shipping via FedEx, we're working on um, kind of widening our output to a retail client, which would be you guys, uh, the adventurous home cooks, the people that, you know, have no fear about popping a couple oysters at home or roasting a duck um, or cooking up some snails. So to that end, um, we still have our online uh, shipping set up where we ship anywhere in the country overnight. Um, and then we're working on getting a product into retail stores. So something that you could get from a brick and mortar store um, whenever you want. So this is, this is that product. 
Um, it's two dozen piconic escargot in the shell. Um, and this is in the freezer. Uh, so this would be in the freezer case, which is good for those shops because they're not taking on the risk of potentially losing inventory. This has a year plus shelf life. We've done a ton of tests with this and we're really pleased with the product and we think it's just as good as fresh. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about where you can find this later, but this is what we're mostly cooking with tonight is these, uh, these boxes of two dozen in shell escargot. Um, so three preparations. Um, they're pretty much finished, but I'm going to kind of walk you through the steps um, to get to the end. Uh, one of them is kind of a very French preparation, the, uh, the Bourguignon preparation. One of them is uh, very Italian, Sicilian, in fact. It's called Babalucci. And uh, the last one is quite American. It is um, escargot kind of pan roasted with bacon lardons over uh, grits or polenta. And that uh, doesn't really get more American than that. So um, let's see, we're gonna start off. So this is the, see, this is gonna be the hard part is me showing you guys what all is in here. So let me, let me pick this phone up. All right, here we go. And let me turn the camera around. All right. So these are the snails. We've braised these, right? This is kind of the initial step when you're working with these in-shell snails. You always want to, to par-cook them first, and it's so easy. Um, it can really be in anything. So this is a broth that we've made of a little bit of chicken stock and thyme, oregano, bay leaf, some lemon. You can do a little white wine. Um, it could be as simple as salted water all right it doesn't need to be complicated or you can really zhuzh it up and put all kinds of aromatics in here put some chili you could do some uh, ginger it's up to you but this initial par cook okay of uh, 30 to 45 minutes it seems like a long time um, but it's not it's really not so it's a very gentle poach a very gentle simmer that you do of these in shell snails so this has already been done um, now let's see here. I'm going to show you the next step. We're going to have to turn this back around. Bear with me. All right. So our snails have been poached. Regardless of what you do with these in-shell snails at this point, we're going to stuff them with a, an herb butter that we've made. Um, but you'll always want to start there. That's kind of like your baseline. So you could throw these on the grill. Uh, you could toss them in a sauce and work them into a pasta dish. Um, it, it, it doesn't matter because at this point they're really nice and tender. You've kind of seasoned them from the inside out. They're going to taste good. They're not going to be chewy. They're going to be nice and tender because you braise them all that kind of that chewiness out of the muscle with your 30 to 45 minute poach, right? Um, so give me just a second. Here. Let me show you what we got. You're doing a great job, Taylor. Scoop these out, all right, and I'm going to show you how to stuff these with a little bit of butter. So we have this recipe on our website, and these retail boxes that I'm talking about, they have recipes in the box. There's actually a pamphlet, a little booklet of preparation instructions and recipes in each box. You don't even have to go to the website. It's all there, right? Very easy. So the snails, you poach them and then you cool them down in the broth because as they cool, they're going to soak up all that liquid, right? You don't want to take them right out hot, but if you let them cool in the broth, they suck it all up. All the flavor goes in. The way to go. This is an herb butter, right? A bourguignon butter. This recipe is on the website too. This uh, could be as simple as parsley, garlic, and shallot. And then from there, you can kind of do what you want with it. So we've added a little bit of white wine and some bourbon and uh, lemon zest. Um, you could do a little ginger in here. You could totally go in a different direction and do truffle and mushroom. You could do uh, a chili butter. You could do lemon and Parmesan, right? You could have fun with it. Um, but use salted butter, that's really important, okay? 
also have these dishes, right? This is gonna be your traditional escargot dish. We sell these um, on the website also. This is not necessary. You don't need one of these. It's really nice for presentation and it makes things super easy. But another way you can do it is you could crumple up some foil on a sheet tray and you could stick the snails in that. The most important thing is that they stay upright right? You don't want all that butter and juicy stuff falling out. So you want to keep them upright. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that would work with a layer of kosher salt or rock salt on the bottom of a baking dish. And you could stick the snails in that too. Either one. So that works if you're doing a lot, right? Because this will only hold six snails. So you get, you know, a few of these where you could do them on a sheet tray with a bunch of salt. So like I said, this is a traditional bourguignon preparation. We're just going to take some of this butter actually a lot, you need a lot of this because you want there to be extra stuff, right? And you're gonna scoop a bunch of this into the opening of the shell, okay? And then these are gonna go in the dish like this. This is very quick. So the, the butter, you can make in advance. And in fact, it's better to make it in advance because then you have an opportunity for all those flavors to kind of really meld and get happy, happy. And the snails, you can poach in advance too. So you could do all of this kind of the night before and then the day of your dinner party or your date night, all you have to do is combine the two things and heat up some bread and pour a glass of wine and you're home free, it's really easy. All right, so if you can cook, if you can cook mussels at home or some shrimp, right? This is just as easy, super easy. All right, so snails are in. I'll show you this. Okay, they're in there. These are gonna go into the oven at 350, 400 degrees, just for a little bit. You just wanna get the bubbles, the, 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 the butter bubbling here because we've already cooked the snails. At this point, you're not really cooking anything. You're just kind of just heating it up and, and uh, melding all those flavors. So this is gonna go in the oven. In the meantime, I'm going to show you a different preparation. So this is the, let's see. So this is the more Italian kind of preparation. And this is uh, Babalucci is, is kind of how they, they call it there. It's actually also what they call uh, snails in, in uh, Italy. So while the French call them escargot and we call them snails here in the US, Sicilians, if they saw a snail on the street, they'd say, oh, there's a Babalucci. Um, so here we go, right? So this is it. This is just a dozen. You could do a whole bunch like this, but these are snails that we've grazed down, okay? with tomato and garlic and red wine and onion, okay? And I'm gonna show you the preparation or the finish on this. This recipe also comes on the website and in those boxes. So to start this, you would get uh, a little bit of olive oil in your pan, you slice some garlic and a little bit of onion, that goes in and you sweat those things out, add some red wine, a generous amount and you'd let that reduce down until it's really nice and thick and then you'd go in with crushed tomatoes can works great in this case right or if it's fresh in the summertime you could use some freshly crushed freshly grown tomatoes but in the winter time this is a great winter time dish you could use the canned stuff and then you go in with the snails and you just let them braise you kind of do this like italian grandmother thing and you stir the pot every now and then and you just let them kind of cook down in this sauce for about a half an hour to 45 minutes. You could go even longer. You go an hour, an hour and a half. All you're doing, as long as the bubbles are kind of slow and low, you're tenderizing the snails and making them kind of suck up all of those flavors. And that's pretty much it. The way that the Italians would serve this is in a bowl. And the utensil of choice are toothpicks. They would actually also use pins or needles, um, which are very effective, but can be dangerous in the wrong hands. So I like the toothpick route. I think they're easy to find and, and you know, they'll work out well. 
You could finish this with a little bit of basil if you want. You could chiffonade some basil into the stew, kind of to finish it off if you wanted to. So it's, it's, it's more or less a tomato and snail stew. Be really good for, oops, really good for wintertime cooking, right? It's hearty, kind of stick to your ribs type stuff. I'm gonna show you guys in a second how to pull these out of the shell because that's very important, right? Knowing how to pull the snails out. Over here, we've got our bacon lardons cooking down. These, are the out of shell snails, right? So these are the shelled ones, the picked meats. You can see the beautiful spirals going on in there. We've just marinated these because we're gonna cook them very quickly. So they're marinating in a little bit of lemon juice and white wine and garlic and parsley uh, because we're gonna, so we'll, we'll cook them very quickly. So you wanna marinate them for maybe about a half an hour beforehand. And we're going to add them, maybe, let's see, it's hard to do with one hand. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to add them to our kind of sizzling bacon over here. All right, here we go. So these are going to kind of plump. And Taylor, these are the petite grease uh, snails. Can you remind everyone what type of snails these are? Now doing it this way, because you're cooking them so quickly, you're going to end up with a very kind of uh, plump and juicy end product. It's almost going to have more of the texture of a clam right, then it will, uh, uh, that typical meaty escargot texture. Um, so this is just another way of doing it. You can, similarly, you can braise these shelled snails just like the in-shell ones, where you would poach them for a half an hour to 45 minutes in a flavorful broth, and you would end up with a very kind of tender, meaty snail also. This quick cook method is kind of fun when you don't have an hour, um, but you have to be prepared for the texture because it is gonna be a little more chewy. If you're okay with things like um, calamari or clams or octopus, and you're okay with that kind of like shellfish chew texture, then this is the way to go, I think. Uh, we're gonna finish this off with just a little squeeze of lemon, right? A lemon juice. All right, and we're gonna plate this in just a second. Let's see how our, okay, you can still hear me, right? Yeah. Okay, let's see how the, uh, the bourguignon has turned out. So this needs just a couple minutes in the oven. This didn't take long at all. This was maybe five minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is it. Super simple. Uh, again, you could do a whole bunch of these if you've got a group of people, if you have a party. Um, really easy. And, 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 you know, the sky is the limit with the stuffing. Um, we just shared... Um, a really nice Italian preparation that utilizes uh, breadcrumbs and pine nuts and a little bit of dried fruit and you could stuff that in there. You could have a very fine uh, sausage, even like a chorizo, and you could stuff that in there. Um, any kind of like garlicky mushroom mixture, cheesy things, those would all go great um, as a filling for this. But this is the, the, 
the, you know, the traditional bourguignon preparation. And you want to serve this with bread, good, warm, crusty French bread, okay? Um, so let me grab that. I guess this is a dinner tonight for you, Taylor, huh? Is this dinner for you tonight? Is this dinner for you tonight? Yeah, just all these snails. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is dinner. So I'm gonna slice some of this, slice some of this bread, and I'll just show you my snail uh, picking techniques. You don't need fancy uh, apparatus. In fact, this is a good point. Uh, some of you may have some snail picking tools, some escargot tools. A lot of people got this stuff back in the 80s and it's kind of been shitting, sitting in a, a cupboard up above the refrigerator and they haven't pulled it out. It's not going to work with these snails because those tongs and those picks are meant for the very large French burgundy snails. So the best way to do this is just get your hands a little bit messy and be okay picking them up in one hand and then toothpick in the other one and you're, you're set. It's really that, that simple. So we're going to slice some of this up. I'll just show you how, how I do this. So toothpick, right? Ooh, another thing that's kind of nice. Lemon, right? Over the top of these guys, right? So you just want to, that's a good finishing move, okay? Let's see if we can get this. Okay, here we go. So here's how I do it. I get the snail in my left hand and I get the pick in my right hand and I make sure I'm kind of like holding everything over the piece of bread because you want all that stuff out onto the bread, right? You don't want to lose any of it. And you stick your pick into the meat of the snail and as you kind of pull, you're simultaneously twisting the snail shell and it's going to release See that? It's perfect, right? So it releases all the good yummy stuff inside. You get a perfect snail. If you tear it, it's not a big deal. It's gonna be okay. Um, and you would put it on your bread like that and you take some wine and you eat this and you go, oh my goodness. Oh, not oh, fair, I need some. <laughs> made escargot, honey. That's incredible. <laughs> and your spouse will love you and say, you are such a fancy cook. It's so easy. Um, same thing with the, the babalucci, right? Serve it with some crusty bread. Your hands are gonna get a little messy. It's okay, it's part of the process. I'd pick one of these up, I'd put a little basil leaf down onto the bread here. Again, stab and kind of as you're pulling, you're twisting a little bit. Whoop. Again, it's okay if you rip it. Let's see, let's get another one here. There we go. All right, so snails down. All right, Babalucci preparation, both in shell. This is kind of a French with the garlic butter. This is stewed with tomatoes and garlic and red wine, um, but similarly uh, delicious. Then, I know I'm driving all you guys crazy with all these snail recipes, and I'm just eating everything in front of you. The American style with the grits and the bacon, We need express delivery. Yeah, express delivery is good. Yeah. All right. So the, the out of shell product is really um, unique because it's even more versatile than the in shell stuff is. Um, it could go into anything. Like I was talking about in the video, Greg Link, incredible ramen dish. Uh, you can put these into wontons. I've done tacos with them. They're really good on pizza. They're really good in pasta. Basically anywhere you could put shrimp or clams, you can do the shelled escargot. 
And then from there on out, it's really all about where you want the texture to be. If you want to be plump and juicy and have the texture of a clam, marinate it and cook it very quickly. If you want it to be more tender and meaty, kind of more of a traditional escargot texture, poach it for about a half an hour to 45 minutes and that's gonna tenderize it. Um, I'm just heating up the polenta. Do we have any questions yet or should I yeah, just- uh, We have a few questions, Taylor. Um, okay. One question, can you just tell us, um, one question from Leanne Lavin. She wants to know how many different kinds of snails do you grow? And what's the future, your outlook um, for the business and for the restaurant business in light of many uh, different kinds of snails? Sure. So white, right now we, we raise one species of snail and that's the Petit Gris, also known as Corneo Aspersum. And really the reason we're raising those snails, there's, there's a couple reasons. One of them is because we think they're probably one of the most delicious eating snails out there. There's thousands of species of snails, but only a few that you could or, or would want to eat. Um, this species has been eaten for a long time, um, all over Europe, really all over the world. Um, and one of the reasons we raise them is because they are here in the US. Um, so even with the special permits that we have, we're not able to import live land snails from other countries. So uh, it is a requirement that our initial crop and any subsequent crops um, come from within the country. So we do occasionally have to kind of repopulate, clean the gene pool, so to speak. Um, you know, if we had the same snails just breeding over and over again inside this greenhouse, it wouldn't turn out so well. So we do have to get some wild snail populations in this species, the Petit Gris or Corneo Aspersum, it exists already in the U.S. Um, in places like California, Texas, Florida. So we're able to bring in some of those wild populations. I would love to eventually uh, get to a point where we can start to raise some other species. I'd love to be able to raise the great big uh, French snails. Those kind of, it's a, it's a different breeding process and they eat very differently. Uh, but for that, we'd have to convince the USDA to let us bring a live species in from outside of the country. Um, I don't know if you've heard about some of the issues with like the uh, the, lan the lantern fly. There's lots of very invasive, uh, you know, species of insects out there that can do a lot of damage. They're super nervous, um, particularly about bringing in uh, things from outside of the country. But but yeah, eventually we'd, we'd like to do something like that. We've also looked into um, cricket farming, which is a whole other thing altogether, but uh, very popular. Uh, you've probably seen uh, cricket flower bars, uh, super high in protein. Sorry, didn't want to burn the full into. Um, I think that was the question. Did I answer the question? Yeah, I think so. And another one from Leanne was um, in light of the coronavirus, right? So we're all in this pandemic. Um, how do we get more Americans to enjoy snails, right? So like mussels and clams and oysters are right now, you know, that's the prolific bivalves, but snails, yeah. like how do we get more Americans to enjoy snails? Well, I think just familiarizing them with the ingredients. Uh, you know, I was talking with Laura that the kind of upwelling of craft oyster farming within the past 10 years has been tremendous. And I think there could be a renaissance like that with escargot. Um, I think the USDA would have to loosen some of its restrictions to make it easier for people to raise them. And then we could have more snail farmers, more awareness about the product. Um, I think just showing people how easy they are to prepare at home, so that's part of our job. Actually, that's that's that is our job is to just uh, you know develop these recipes uh, and to just show people how, how easy it is. And we it took a long time for us to figure some of this stuff out. When we first started cooking these, I didn't realize that it was kind of like one minute or forty five minutes, and anything in between was no good. It took it took a little while to figure that out uh, and get it really dialed in. But now we understand how the protein works. And we know that you either need to cook it very quickly or braise it for a half an hour to 45 minutes. Um, and you end up with something really tasty. So um, 
yeah, I think we're just trying to make it as easy as possible for home cooks to feel comfortable with it. And, and that means providing recipes, um, you know, doing things like this to, to show how easy it is to cook. Um, and, and I think we're getting there. We're making some headway. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. You are a, a snail blazer, if you will. Um, yeah. You, you yeah. know, you are one of two uh, people that are doing this in the country, right? Yeah, there's a, there's, there's a couple of smattering of very, you know, small operations. It's so hard to call them. They're certainly not commercial snail farms, but they're like people with snails. And so they're like, well, we're a snail farm. And I'm like, okay, fine, you're a snail farm. Um, but, but yeah, we, we're certainly kind of the biggest and only commercial operation in the States, yeah. And all the recipes people can get on your website. So as they want to, if, if number one, I think you told us that they can purchase the snails through you, correct? Yes, hang on just a second. Okay. Yeah, don't burn the polenta. No, no, no. <laughs> Italians, it's not good to burn polenta. It's like burning risotto. I know. This is our American preparation, so we're calling it grits tonight, but. Okay, grits. <laughs> polenta grits. Um, yes, so there's, it's, it's kind of almost ridiculous how many methods of, of purchasing you can do. We've kind of tried to open it up and make it as easy as possible. The easiest method is to order online and have it shipped right to your front door. It's going to cost you a little bit of money. I think it's $15 to get it shipped to you in New York State, but it ships overnight FedEx and it's right on your doorstep. You don't have to leave. Um, that's through our website at piconicescargo.com. If you live locally, you could come and pick up at the farm if you really want to, um, or if you're looking for um, the shelled snails or, uh, you know, a non frozen product. Um, these boxes, which I was just talking about, these were launching and, and these are already in six locations, um, mostly on the North Fork. Um, we've got them at, uh, South Hold Fish Market, at the Village Cheese Shop in Mattituck, um, at Bayview Farms, uh, in Aquabog, at Malowski's Chicken Farm, in Calverton at the Cheese and Spice Market in Wading River. And then our farthest west location so far is actually at the Taste New York um, oh, Welcome okay. Center off the LIE. <laughs> so you could go for a rest stop and pick up some snails. But we're working on getting them into some places um, on the South Fork next. So hopefully we'll have them in, you know, six to 10 locations uh, in the Hamptons area by the end of the year. And then we'll just continue our westward expansion. Yeah. So they can't. So New York City right now they can't, can't get in any shops in New York City. No, we don't have it in any shops in the city. We're working on it, taking okay. some time. But um, yeah, it'll be it'll be there. You know, hopefully soon. Great. Let me. Uh, I'll just yeah, finish. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I'll just finish this dish. So this is the uh, the American preparation, right? We do have a question from Eileen Duffy. Sure. Yeah. She said, Burgundy seems to be escargot central. Do you know how, why that happened? What's escargot? Burgundy seems to be escargot central. Do uh, you know how, why that happened? Well, they have a long uh, history of eating snails there, although many countries do. Um, the Burgundy snails that they raised there were wild uh, and native to that area. So they didn't, you know, they weren't always in farms. Um, you know, people would go out in the morning after a rainy day and they would, they would pick these snails from the woods. Um, as to a history beyond that, I, I'm not sure. Um, I'll have to refer to a, a different snail historian. But um, it's funny, we're do I'm doing a lot of research into, um, Kind of snail consumption worldwide and we're learning that many um yeah, let me just show you this what we have here so this is kind of our creamy whew, what do we got creamy polenta or grits um this is something you could do as uh an appetizer or kind of a side course. Um, there's a restaurant in New York City called Frenchette and they serve snails um, on kind of a bed of um, uh, 
uh, eggs, uh, brouillade, so very slowly cooked scrambled eggs. So they're super kind of delicate and creamy. Um, any, any kind of starch, right, with these things, it, it's gonna be a good thing and your guests are gonna be happy. Um, but I really like this kind of polenta or grits preparation. Let me just show you what this ends up looking like. Mm. Right, hang on, we should wipe this. Sorry, I know you guys are being tossed around. The chef, okay. the chef is not, not liking the dirty plate. So here we go, right? Big old pile of grits, bacon lardons. We've got these super plump, juicy snails. That's fun. That looks delicious. So when are you delivering? <laughs> I'll call DoorDash. We're calling DoorDash. Um, we have another question, Taylor. Um, someone's asking if the snails are frozen at Charlie's uh, at South Hole Fish Market. They are. They have the, the in-shell two dozen um, box. So, and I, I know initially, and, and especially, I'll tell you what, we were really against the freezing thing. But we've done so many tests. Those snails, I know you guys didn't get to taste them, but those came out of that freezer, that frozen box. They're so good. You cannot, I can't tell the difference. And I've eaten a bajillion of these things. Um, so don't worry about that. But yeah, Charlie has the, um, the box of two dozen in shell frozen. Um, yeah, it's, it's the only way we can get them into the retail shops because the fresh stuff, as wonderful as it is, uh, it only has a seven day shelf life and they just won't, it, they can't take it on. It's just too much risk because um, they'll end up throwing it out if they don't move it fast enough. So this way, you know you're getting a great product. If you want the fresh stuff being not frozen, um, you can come pick it up from us in Kutchog um, or order online. Yeah. Great. And do you find that chefs uh, pre-COVID, maybe even now, you know, that some restaurants are opening up, do you find that some, I mean, I guess it doesn't make a difference. You just kind of explain that. Um, whether it's fresh escargot or frozen escargot, I mean, how, what do you find in, the, in New, York, New York City? Like in those clips, are you bringing fresh or is it frozen? Well, because they're so close, it's, it's, it's fresh. Uh, we only process one day a week. So, and we only process to order. So I don't have any inventory. When a chef calls me up, they have to call us on Monday and they say, I want 300 snails. And then we go and we kill 300 snails and we bring them to them the next day. Um, so it's quite fresh. But we also have chefs on the, side of the country in California and Seattle, and they'll take larger bulk amounts and then they'll kind of freeze them, whatever they're not using, and they, you know, thaw or slack what they need just for that week. And it's a great way to do it. Um, but typically the people on the East Coast are adhering to our, you know, our processing schedule and they get them, you know, they get a delivery every week. Yeah. I'd like to see them in a taco. I bet you that would be really good. Oh, uh, they're great taco. Yeah, I, I, we cooked them down with uh, some chilies and made a really nice mole sauce, um, a little bit of uh, like cilantro and, and just a uh, very thinly shaved onion. And uh, they're really good that way. Yeah. I'm, tr I'm trying to get someone to do a pizza. If anyone has, <laughs> oh. I, think, I think they'd be a great. So uh, if anyone wants to, you know, give that a go, I just think, you know, the clam pie is a good thing, right? If we could get someone to put these on a pizza with lots of garlic and herbs. I know who could do that for you. Okay, well. Fabrizio Faccini. He's okay. an Italian chef. He's on Slow Food New York State. He's part of Slow Food, but he is the master at pizza. Perfect. And he, I will connect you with him because you and him would do a really, you guys should get together because he would be the perfect person to connect with. That sounds great. Yeah, we need a, we need a good pizza guy. Yeah, he's <laughs> the one. I'll connect you with him. All right. Uh, anything else? What else? Any other questions? Someone's asking, how do you freeze them? Like, how do you freeze snails? What's the process in freezing snails? Like, what, how do you do that? <laughs> well, we use, a, we, I mean, uh, the, well, we, it, for these products, we're packaging them fresh, so not frozen, and then they would go to the 
distributor and be put in their freezer. So at that point, they would be frozen. I guess that I don't know if that answers the question or not. Yeah. We don't. Aside from aside from these uh, products, we don't we don't freeze anything. So everything else would go straight to the customer, um, not frozen. And and here's another little tidbit that I know that whatever the snails eat, they take on a certain flavor, right? So do you get to order from chefs? They say, hey, I want my snail to have a mushroom flavor. Or I want my snail to have a carrot flavor. Do do you feed, do you do specialized with chefs in reference to taste for snail? Yeah, we've done that once uh, with 11 Madison Park. They wanted uh, mint fed snails. So we actually had to do a lot of trials because snails um, can be picky eaters. So we had to make sure they would eat the mint first. And they did and they liked it. And so um, we finished um, all their snails with mint and they, they do take on that flavor. That's unique um, to these species because you're eating the whole thing. So when you get a snail out of a can, because they're those great big burgundy snails, the foot or the muscle is the only thing you're eating, right? The belly has been cut away and discarded. It's not in the can. It's only part of the snail that ends up in the can. And the belly is not part of it. Um, with these, you eat the whole thing, like a clam or a mussel. So you also consume what they last ate. And so we're very particular about what that is. Um, we finish them on herbs um, for the most part. So things like tarragon, parsley, basil. Um, so you're tasting all those really nice um, herbaceous flavors when you eat them, yeah. And are you able to share with us um, what you feed your snails? Yeah, so when they're growing, it's a lot of dirt. Uh, they're kept on soil until a certain age because they need the calcium. They eat, they eat the dirt. Um, the calcium in the soil builds their kind of strong shells and we supplement with a little additional calcium. And then at some point, um, they don't need that soil anymore. So they can just be in the pins and then we're feeding them with wild plants. So, um, in the, uh, spring through fall, it's things like clover, burdock, uh, dandelion, um, sorrel, uh, am I still here? Okay. Yeah, you are. Um, so wild plants. Um, in the winter time, we have to supplement that with lettuces and herbs. And then for finishing, it's, it's strictly um, herbs. You saw in the video um, with the beer grain, the spin beer grain, we did do some experimenting with that at the time of that video that was shot about two years ago. Um, and we're not doing the beer grain right now. We've just felt like uh, the herbs are a better finish um, product for them. So it, 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 they take on more flavor. Um, the beer grain was really fun, but it just didn't kind of pronounce itself enough in the finished product. So um, right now we're just finishing them on, them on herbs. So a quick answer to the question would be dirt, then wild plants, and then tasty herbs like basil and parsley. Nice. Anyone else have any questions? Oh, someone's asking, how do you kill a snail? Good question. Uh, we can't reveal the exact method. Uh, many, in fact, all uh, snail producers, to my knowledge, um, will kill their snails through steaming them um, or boiling them, kind of like a lobster. And we decided early on that we didn't want to go that route. We wanted to offer a product as, um, as raw and kind of untouched as possible. So these snails are completely raw, and we, we do that by lowering their body temps down to a temperature that they can't stand anymore. So unfortunately their little snail hearts stop uh, working, they get too cold and they expire, at which point we uh, pack them up and send them off. So that was about as eloquently as I can describe a snail death. That's life. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else has any questions. Taylor, all I could say is Thank you so much. Um, yeah. This was an absolute pleasure to have you uh, here to spend time with us today to, you know, talk to us about the Botanic Escargot and about your journey and becoming a snail wrangler. I just want to let everyone know that, you know, if you want to purchase your snails, right, they can go to PeconicEscargot.com. Yeah. Yep. And then, yep. That's the spot. And then some of the places that you had mentioned, some of those stores. Yeah, the stores, the North Fork, those all have them in stock uh, right now. Um, so you can go grab some for uh, dinner this weekend. We only ship 
um, the fresh stuff on Tuesdays. So if you're looking for something to cook this weekend, I would recommend going to one of those stores. And I would suggest that everyone share this experience with everyone about your escargot farm. Please. And, and just so you know that this video will be, on, will be live on Slow Food East End. So this will be, you know, for everyone to see if they missed it. Great. So, yeah, next up for you will be Slow Food USA. We'll have you on their Slow Food live show. Oh, good. I'll get, yeah, I'll get someone to hold the camera so I'm not fumbling around. With no, it. you did a great job. Really good job. Oh, good. I'm glad everyone, I hope everyone enjoyed it. And uh, Could I you repeat the stores for me one more time? And I'm going to put it in the chat for everyone, the stores. Yeah, the stores that have been stock from east to west are uh, Southhold Fish Market, uh, the Village Cheese Shop on Love Lane, um, Bayview Farms in Aquabog, uh, Malowski's Poultry Farm in Calverton, the Cheese and Spice Market in Wading River, and uh, the Taste New York Welcome Center off the LIE. And then, like I said, we're working on getting some into the South Fork. If you have any suggestions, uh, if anyone wants to, you know, shout out their local fish market or something like that, I think it would be a good product for them. Shoot us uh, a message and let us know. We'd love to get it in there. Yeah, like Corjay's. Corjay's would be great. He's on the list, yeah. That would be a good one for you. For sure. All right, Taylor. Well, I want to thank everybody for attending um, this session. Um, it was really, really great and a lot of fun. So thank you very, very much. Thank of course, you. of course. Okay. Thanks, guys. And I hope you, uh, yeah, I hope Thanks so much. Thanks, Penny. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Thanks a lot. Take care. Yeah. Thank you. Be well. Hi, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. That was great.